Hypertension, otherwise known as the silent killer, affects millions of Americans, and uh, most likely somebody in your family, if not you, uh, will have hypertension in this lifetime. So uh, it's the most common uh, reason for an office visit. Over 65 million uh, Americans are affected with it. And only one third of those have their hypertension under control. So this is something that we need to get better at taking care of, uh, both at identifying and uh, at treating. So what causes hypertension? Well, 90 to 95 percent of all hypertension is known as essential hypertension, which basically means we don't understand the mechanisms of how uh, it develops, but we do have uh, some ideas about how to uh, decrease risk factors and, uh, and treat it. Secondary hypertension is anything that will uh, cause us to increase our blood pressure. So renal vascular and renal hypertension uh, have to do with uh, the function of the kidneys. For example, if you have a, uh, a renal artery stenosis or any reason that we might not be getting as much blood to the kidneys, then the kidneys might end up uh, conserving more water uh, and increasing the overall fluid volume as well as releasing uh, angiotensin, which uh, contracts blood vessels and contributes to uh, to hypertension. Endocrine disorders can cause hypertension uh, by a number of different mechanisms. Um, adrenal causes, you can have uh, increased production of mineralocorticoids or uh, corticosteroids. Both can increase your blood pressure. Uh, hyperthyroidism and uh, pituitary uh, dysfunction like uh, hyper-ACTH uh, can increase your blood pressure. Lots of medications and toxins can increase your blood pressure. Being pregnant, uh, sleep disturbances such as sleep apnea can increase blood pressure and uh, any type of potassium def deficiency. So again, these, these account for maybe 10 or maybe 5% of all hypertension. And they're some of the more treatable uh, causes of hypertension. So the main risk factors, uh, we've got most of them here in this picture. This guy uh, is uh, obese. He's got his uh, fries on his plate. He's uh, smoking and drinking alcohol, living a sedentary lifestyle. Um, I don't know why he has a calculator on the table there, but he's probably uh, trying to calculate you know, his calories. Uh, but being a, a black African American is a, a risk factor. Having a family history, obesity, diet, uh, tobacco and alcohol, uh, we don't quite understand the mechanisms of why those are related, but they, they, do, uh, they do seem to be related. And salt intake, which has recently uh, gotten a little bit of press. Uh, some, some are saying that it's not quite as important as it uh, was uh, initially thought to be in hypertension, uh, but the science is still pretty strong for uh, or sodium restriction. In, uh, in lowering your risk factors of hypertension. So we have different stages. Pre-hypertension is uh, 120 to 139. Uh, stage one is uh, 140 to 159, and stage two is 160 and above. Uh, it's, it's easiest for me just to remember the cutoff points, uh, 120, 140, 160, and uh, and some people use 180 as a measurement of, of hypertensive urgency, which we'll talk about in a second. So th these different stages affect how we treat hypertension. They, uh, they don't necessarily always correlate with the uh, outcome, but, but they give us some cutoff points for how we treat it. 
Hypertensive urgency, which I mentioned a moment ago, is uh, basically just a, a designation for uh, the need for immediate action or the, the lowering of, of blood pressure uh, fairly quickly. There, the definition of hypertensive urgency as opposed to malignant hypertensive tension or hypertensive emergency uh, is the uh, presence or absence of end organ damage. Now some texts I've seen that will group uh, hypertensive urgency and hypertensive emergency under the category of malignant hypertension. But uh, up to date and uh, the sources I trust the most uh, separate malignant hypertension uh, from hypertensive urgency uh, and basically equate it with hypertensive emergency. So end organ damage, uh, what are we talking about there? Well, hypertension damages the heart, the kidneys, the vasculature. Uh, well, any basically anywhere that you have vasculature, you can have damage, uh, but we most often talk about heart, kidney, uh, the brain, you can have hypertensive encephalopathy, and, uh, and the eyes are, are most often affected by malignant hypertension. So a little bit more about uh, malignant hypertensive tension or hypertensive emergency. The end organ damage, like we mentioned, encephalopathy, renal failure, and congestive heart failure are the big uh, signs of malignant hypertension. And uh, these are the instances where we need to immediately uh, lower the blood pressure. Not too fast, but right away. So uh, in order to diagnose hypertension, we need to do screening. Most people just need to be screened every two years, or, or most people that don't have uh, any uh, pre-hypertension. Once you get into that 120 to 139 range, we want to start checking you every year if we're not already treating you. The, the way that it's measured officially is you have to have this uh, over three to, s three to six visits. You have to have uh, uh, high blood pressure measurements over three to six visi visits. And that's because uh, when you first go to a doctor's office, you're going to have uh, a higher blood pressure. With the people over 65, uh, you want to start monitoring for postural hypertension or uh, postural uh, difference in hypertension because you, you can often get uh, orthostatic hypertension in uh, those over 65. And uh, so ambulatory blood pressure monitoring is indicated when we have uh, any reason to think that uh, this might be a, a white coat hypertension. So if, uh, if people mention that they're really nervous or they, they say that, you know, it's never this high when I go to the grocery store and check it, it's a good time to try out uh, giving them an ambulatory blood pressure monitor or having them pick one up at the store. And generally you want to check that with uh, the blood pressures that you get in the office. But then have them, have them take their blood pressure over a few weeks and, uh, and compare it with the measurements you're getting in the office. You might also want to do this if uh, we're having a hard time controlling the hypertension. You know, if they're getting consistent high measurements in the office and uh, you are giving them uh, adic or appropriate therapy and they're not responding to it, or if we suspect uh, some kind of a secondary hypertension, uh, maybe an adrenal cause like a pheochromocytoma, be a good time to use uh, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. So how do we treat it? The first line therapy is uh, with uh, non-pharmacological or uh, lifestyle change. So weight loss, exercise, and diet are all uh, are all ways that we can decrease uh, the risk factors of hypertension, as well as alcohol and tobacco cessation. Now the uh, the literature. Uh, has historically had um, uh, not not super impressive results with uh, 
non-pharmacological therapy, but that could be due to a lot of reasons um, that people aren't uh, in com compliant or um, that uh, there's just, just not enough of a difference in lifestyle. But this is still first line, so if we have somebody with uh, mild hypertension, this is what we go to first. Although, although a lot of people will uh, give medical hypertension along with uh, lifestyle change uh, on a first diagnosis of hypertension. The different uh, medical therapies that we use for hypertension is anything that uh, decreases blood pressure. So uh, diuretics like thiazides and, and loops, there's obviously a couple more. Uh, categories of diuretics that we use as well, like potassium sparing diuretics, um, ACE inhibitors, and ARBs are uh, effective and, and often used therapy. Beta blockers, alpha blockers, uh, calcium channel blockers. So, uh, a lot of these involve uh, the decrease of um, of uh, vasoconstriction like uh, beta blockers, alpha blockers, calcium channel blockers, also all vasodilate, as well as ACE inhibitors. So uh, uh, decreasing the, the constriction, the resistance in the blood pressure, or the blood vessels is, uh, is one of the main ways that we lower blood pressure. Back to lifestyle modification. The, the indications for it, it's, uh, it's the first line therapy for mild hypertension without comorbidity. And we'll talk just a second about what, uh, how comorbidities will affect the way that we treat this. Um, but one of the benefits of lifestyle modification is, is we're also gonna lower lipids and uh, just increase the phy physiologic reserve of the patient. So uh, it's never a bad idea to stop smoking and uh, to start eating good food and and start exercising. So with the uh, medical treatment, one of the ways that we decide what uh, treatments to give is if there are other diseases present. So uh, if there are no comorbidities, then we'll, we'll probably start with like a th thiazide diuretic. We've been using them for a long time and they're really effective. Um, but, if they d but if they have uh, diabetes, or, or CHF, then you want them on uh, an ACE inhibitor uh, or an ARB. With CHF, you, you also use beta blockers and potassium sparing diuretics. Uh, with MI, beta blockers and ACE inhibitors. Osteoporosis, you want to use thiazides. Now, wha why do you use thiazides? Well, we know that uh, loops uh, lose calcium and uh, thiazides keep calcium. So uh, you certainly wouldn't want to use a loop, so you're, you would be depleting your calcium, uh, but the thiazide can keep the, the calcium in. Uh, BPH, use an alpha blocker. Uh, alpha blockers help to uh, relax the, um, the smooth muscle and it helps uh, uh, avoid urination problems. And in pregnancy, the main point in pregnancy is that you, you don't use ACE inhibitors. Uh, but methyl dopa is a, uh, is a safe way to lower blood pressure in pregnancy. And they also use beta blockers like labetalol. So uh, sometimes some drugs that you don't use, you don't use beta blockers if you have COPD, diabetes, or hyperkalemia. You don't use ACE inhibitors in pregnancy, uh, renal artery stenosis and renal failure. You don't use potassium sparing diuretics in renal failure. Uh, diuretics in general uh, can precipitate gout and uh, thiazides uh, can uh, exacerbate uh, diabetes. So obviously there's a lot more that we can talk about with uh, hypertension. If there's anything uh, that uh, you feel is really important that we should have talked about um, in this brief overview, please send me an email or leave a comment below. And uh, re just remember that these are uh, uh, 
just guidelines uh, to help learn medicine. They're not to, they're not to guide clinical practice. So hopefully you will be looking at your own studies uh, before you start making uh, decisions clinically, but this is a good way to help get started. Thank you.